ان الحمد لله وحده الصلاه والسلام على من لا نبي بعد وبعد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم we are discussing regarding our approach towards a worldly life so worldly life in between praise and dispraise so are we supposed to praise it outrightly or we are supposed to dispraise it outrightly or what should be our approach to it so as we have discussed that one group one group of the people they think that it's the root of all evil so we need to shun it we need to give it up we need to avoid it outrightly we have to abandon all the worldly activities otherwise this will distract us from achieving the specific goals and then there is another approach which is quite based on the quran and sunna and that's what we need to learn and understand is that the worldly life as imam al ghazali rahimahullah says wealth is not to be dispraised or condemned in its own right what's blame worth is man's bad use of of this wealth represented in culpable culpable qualities and acts such as avarice hoarding of wealth showing off with it and gaining it unlawfully that's that's why allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says your riches and your children may be but a trial the surah at taqabun verse number 15 innama amwalukum wa auladukum fitnah so from this verse uh, we, we learn that it is truly a source of test so what kind of test is a test to be understood that we have to leave it we have to outrightly abandon it all the test is that we are supposed to show our obedience to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with acquiring and accumulating the wealth so islam gives us a proper direction a proper approach that this as far as the worldly wealth is concerned we cannot say it is good or it is bad what makes it good is a proper usage of it what makes it bad is a improper usage of it so it depends upon actually the wealth itself be it the gold the silver or the cash or any form of the wealth any assets of its own it's neither good nor bad so what makes it good or bad is approach of the people which also applies to the world is this electronic gadgets mobile phone is it good or bad we cannot say an answer outrightly it is good or it is bad it depends upon the usage of a person if a person uses properly then it is good if a person uses improperly it is bad so same applies to the wealth as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created it as i said before khalaka lakum he created it for you so if that he created to we are supposed to accumulate it and we are supposed to take benefit of it, out of it but at the same time the main objective behind the wealth is that it must be used in order to serve ourselves serve our family serve our fellow beings so that this becomes a source of maghfira fas a source of getting the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's what we are we are we have been created for to achieve the rida of allah to achieve the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our master our creator is pleased with us that's main objective in our life why allah created us so that we achieve his pleasure is a higher station that is maqam ur rida that allah is pleased with us when we leave this dunya when we leave this world we leave this in a state in a way that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with us ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'innah irji'i ila rabbika radiyatan mardiya fadkhuli fi ibadi wa dkhuli jannati so we we achieve that level that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us oh the pleased pleasant soul now we enter among my slaves our among my servants and you enter my jannah so our goal has been set our objective has been defined that why we are here 
many of the people of the world don't know about it. What they are here, like the two, they are the animals, wallahi. Just eating and drinking, fulfilling all the desires of the nafs and nothing else. But surely, when they are not aware about their purpose of life, and after fulfilling all the commands of the nafs, they are fed up, they are desperate. And most of them, they try to just put an end to their life. You see that one of the main cause of suicide is that a person is not aware about his position in this world, why he is here, why Allah created him. How can he please his, his master, his creator, the one who brought him into existence, the one who blessed him with many things surrounded and his, his blessings are surrounding him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a, one of the, I should say, the one of the best blessings upon a person is he is aware about his own position in this world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this wealth and we need to know that how we are supposed to spend this. Because firstly we are, we are supposed to know how to earn this wealth and then how to spend it. As Prophet sallallahu ta'ala that on the day of judgment that ما تزال لا تزال قدم عبدي يوم القيامة حتى يسأل عن خمس. That the feet of son of Adam will not move from his place unless and until he he is questioned. He is being asked about five things. وعن عمره في ما أفنى about his life, how he spent his life, how he used his life. وعن شبابه في ما أبلى about his youth, how he used, how he spent his youth. وَعَمَّالِهِ About his wealth مِنْ أَيْنَ اِكْتَسَبْتَهِ How did you earn your wealth? And the fourth question وَفِيمَ أَنْفَقْتَ How did you spend your wealth? So we are we are not free in order to earn the wealth we have to see the lawful means of the wealth as there are many unlawful means as a means of test for us Bani Israel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them not to fish on Saturday and as a means of test, Saturday, the river used to be full of fishes. They would jump up. This was a means of test for them. So they scumbled to this test. They could not stand by the test. So they developed, they devised many treacherous ways to catch the fishes on Saturday. Though they would not take them out on, on Saturday, then Sunday morning they would go there and take, take them out. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made many and unlawful ways of earning also. Why so? Because after all, we are supposed to be tested. So test will be how do we earn? Are we lawful? Are we sincere? Many a times we may not be able to get a lot of profit. We may not be able to get a lot of, get a lot of wealth because the halal means are restricted. But at the same breath, there are many opportunities for us, many avenues to make a lot of wealth. But those means will be unlawful, prohibited by Allah and His Messenger Wasallam. Whoever stops here, whoever prevents himself to get involved in any prohibited activity, to earn the wealth through forbidden ways, yes, he got the success. He truly got the success. As far as the dunya is concerned, Wallahi, whatever Allah has decreed for us, we are going to get it. By hook or crook, willingly or unwillingly, we have to get it. Whatever Allah has decided for us. And dunya is according to the decree of Allah. And deen according to the efforts of a person. We need to understand this very importantly. Dunya, wealth of dunya is according to the decree of Allah. So here, though we are supposed to make our efforts, but even more and more efforts will not make it, will not increase a single penny in what Allah has decreed already for us. So dunya or the wealth is according to the decree of Allah. And then, it's not according to decree, it is according to the efforts of a person. More efforts we make for deen, more rewards we get from Allah. More higher stations we get. So dunya is fixed, we can say in a way. And deen, it is quite expendable, depending upon the efforts of a person. 
a simple example if we have a water tank say 1000 liter if we just put one tap into it and then we open the tap how much will come out just 1000 whatever is inside that, that that will come out it is one single tap but what if we put two taps or three taps to it one tap here one tap there one tap there then we open all these three taps how much will come out again the same 1000 more we put the taps it will not increase one single liter half a liter it will not increase because whatever is already there it is going to give back that much whether we use one tap or many taps same is case with our our life of dunya our portion from dunya it's already decided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala though as I said before we have to make efforts but not to the level that we forget each and everything we have to make the efforts within the limits not to be just crazy about it that we forget about our akhirah we forget our own purpose of life we have to make efforts within the limits wallahi if we put more and more efforts that we forget everything we will not get anything man kana yurid harsa dunya nu'tihi minha whoever wants the the life of this dunya the wealth of this dunya man kana yurid harsa dunya Allah says in the quran man kana yurid harsa dunya nu'tihi minha whoever wishes the possessions of the world nu'tihi minha we shall give give him some portion of it and there is no portion for him in the Akhirah. Whoever wants, whoever wishes the benefit of Akhirah, we increase his benefit, we increase his crops. Harf actually means harf. Harf means crops. Hirs with sword. Hirs means a virus, means greed. Man kana yurid harsa dunya Whoever wants the crops of the dunya The life, the, the, the things of dunya Chattels of dunya Nu'tihi minha A portion of it we give to him But that portion is fixative Our more and more efforts won't increase a bit On the other hand Woman kana yurid harsa akhira Whoever wants the crops of akhira we increase, we keep on increasing according to, according to his efforts. So what we learn, life of dunya is based on the portion of dunya, the chattels of dunya, the possessions of dunya, the wealth of dunya is based on the decree of Allah. And as far as the deen is concerned, thawab, the reward is concerned, is according to the efforts of a person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created all these things. We need to understand this very much. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about Qarun. We know Qarun, he was one of the richest men among the Bani Israel. Very much rich. Allah d describes us whenever he used to come to the people in high grandeur way, in a sublime and superb way, with all his possessions expressed and defined. He would come along with all his wealth and his worldly grandeur. Then the people of dunya, they would look at him, they would cry out, they would sigh. Ya laytana mithla ma qarun. We wish that we were given the wealth as that of the Qarun. You see how much fortunate he is. Innahu ladhu hazdin azim. He's undoubtedly is highly fortunate. This is the approach of those people who don't know their purpose of life, who don't know that they are responsible, who are unaware that they are accountable before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all their deeds. So their approach is, they say, Ya layta lana mithla ma We wish we were given the wealth as that of the Qarun. Innahu ladhu hazdin azim. He is truly the most fortunate person. This is one approach. Second approach is that of the true believers. They were the true followers of Musa alayhi salam. They said, Why lakum? What you are thinking? 
Why lagum? Your thinking we perished. Why lagum? What happened to your thinking? Thawabullah khair. The reward with Allah is better. Why? Because however wealth you achieve in this dunya, you accumulate in this dunya, at the time of death you have to depart, you have to leave it behind. But whatever action, whatever good deeds you perform for the sake of Allah, its reward is unperishable, is eternal and everlasting. So we should focus upon the things which are enduring and everlasting, which are not going to depart from us. On the other hand, you are just, you are crazy about the things which you know yourself of your own that you have to leave it behind once you die. At the time of your death, there must be a departure from your wealth and from you. There's a point, there's a time of departure. Nothing will go along with you. However, if you do good, if you, if you prove your loyalty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you will see the reward of it is ever and ever forever, unlimited, everlasting and eternal. That's why they said, why lakum, you vote your thinking. What happened to you? What types of barriers are upon, the, upon your eyes that you cannot see the true things? You cannot see the things in the right perspective. As this dunya, the worldly life is when it is without the bounds, without the limits. When there is strong desire in a person to achieve and accumulate it. It's like, it's, it's, it's as that of the intoxication. This... Uh, the strong desire for the world is like the intoxication which makes a person to be unaware of everything. As if a person is intoxicated. And this worldly intoxication is the dangerous of all intoxications. Because it is because of this worldly intoxication a person may go to the extent of killing other people. He is he, he, he's, he's ready to play the gambling. He is ready to do each and everything. That's what here Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib his statement aptly befits what he says The strong unlimited love of dunya is the root of all evil. Why people kill other people? Because of wealth. Why people are motivated to play the gambling? It is because of the wealth. Why people cheat others to have more wealth? Why people betray others to have more wealth? The strong desire and love for dunya is the root of all evil. When a person is not having the limits, when a person does not know the proper approach with this dunya, then this dunya will immerse him into it and he will have this intoxication which he will be rid of at the time of death only. This intoxication cannot be removed from anything except by taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By the true love of Allah. They can be only either of the two things. True love of Allah in the heart or true love of dunya. Both cannot stay together. There are two opposite poles which cannot be joined together. There are two opposite poles. So, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he mentions this, that uh, wealth of its own is not dispraised rather or condemned rather it is our approach it's, it's, it's our it's our our dealing with it and uh, the pious and that was so that was also why the writers predecessors used to fear the trial of wealth Yahya ibn Mu'adh rahimahullah said wealth is a scorpion if you do not intend to deal with it properly, so do not take it from the beginning. Because it stings you. Its poison will kill you. Someone asked it, and how can we deal with it properly? He answered, gain it, that is wealth, by lawful means and spend it where it should be legally spent. So if it is like a scorpion, if it is not dealt with proper, with proper care, then it will, it will bite a person, it will sting a, sting a person. And... It will kill a person. So the proper way is to earn it through lawful means and then to spend through the lawful means. This way a person is preparing himself for the Akhirah, for the two questions of the Akhirah. As I said before, 
Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that the feet of Ad, son of Adam will not move until he answers five questions. And the two questions will be, so we can say, 40% questions will be regarding how did you earn the wealth and how did you spend the wealth. So 60% is regarding his life, his youth and then his knowledge. The fifth question will be about his knowledge, how much he practiced his knowledge. So 40% question is regarding how did you earn and how did you spend. So did you earn the lawful, through lawful means? Yes, there are many people who earn through lawful means. Then they think now it belongs to them. The wealth is of, it belongs to them. They have accumulated this wealth through lawful means. Now it's their choice, however they want to be spent it. No. We are bound to see the means, the channels of earning. Then we are also, we are also responsible and accountable for the channels of spending. For both the things we shall be questioned. For both the approaches we shall be asked about. How did you earn and how did you spend? And, and as I said before that, as far as the wealth is concerned, there are many advantages of the wealth and there are many disadvantages of the wealth. And we have already, you have already learned that wealth is not to be dispraised in its own right because it is a means that helps man in his worldly and religious affairs. So it is a means of support for man, as Allah Almighty states, to those weak of understanding, make not over your property, which Allah had made a means of support for you. Surah An-Nisa was number 5. Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib rahimahullah said, there is no goodness in a person who does not gain property through lawful means in order to protect himself from the humiliation of begging, begging people. Keep Keep good relations with his kinship and give out its dues, that is zakah. Wealth has worldly and religious advantages. All people are aware of its worldly advantages and that's why they are busy seeking them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this wealth as a, as a, we can say, one of the important support for our, life, our survival. We cannot deny the fact that wealth is important for our survival. That's why there are many ahkam regarding the wealth in the Quran and Sunnah. If it were totally to be avoided, totally to be abandoned, then how come the teachings of the Quran will throw much light upon the wealth? The Prophet in many of the hadiths has thrown the light upon the, the, the importance of the wealth how, and at the same time the utilization of the wealth. How can we utilize our wealth, our lawful wealth? So it is not advisable, it is not uh, recommended on the part of the Sharia that a person avoid it. Rather, what Sayyid Ibn al-Musayib says, Rahimahullah, there is no goodness in a person who does not gain property through lawful means in order to protect himself. Because wealth, it protects a person from many harms. It protects a person from many, many, many bad things. Like, uh, if a person is not having anyone, anything with him, then he is supposed to extend his hand towards others. So bringing humiliation to himself. That's what Prophet ﷺ said, that if a person extends his hand and he is able to earn of, him, of his own, still by his still his begging, he will come on the day of judgment in a state that his face will be full of bones, there will be no flesh on it. So it is, it is tremendously forbidden by Islam that a person should beg, except in a state of necessity. A person is, for example, a person is handicapped, he is not able to earn, uh, a person is in a dire need and he cannot survive, or his children are in, in a state of dire need. So in a state of necessity, uh, it, is, it is permissible for a person to extend his hand. But in normal course, it is highly prohibited. In Islam, the begging is highly prohibited because it makes a person to be dependent on others and then put earning humiliation for his own self. Self-respect in Islam is very important. And through begging, this self-respect is altogether vanished. It is put to an end. There is no self-respect for the beggar. So what say, that's what Sayyid Ibn al-Musayib says, 
that if a person has proper means of income, it will save him, save him himself to put his self-respect uh, on risk. It will not push him to the humiliation. Because many a times when a beggar is asking for something, many a people scold them, rebuke them, reprimand them, and they have to, they have to face all these uh, scolds and reprimands of the people. They have to face this humiliation on the part of the people. And then, uh, keep good relationship with his kinship. One of the best form of sadaqa is to spend it upon those who are in the relationship. There are two rewards. One, maintaining the ties of kinship. Second, helping him out. That's why ulama say that if a person is supposed to spend his zakah, first of all, he must see in his own in his own kinship, in his own relationship. If there is someone who needs it, then it must be given to him because there are two rewards. One, the reward of the sadaqah, the reward of the zakah, and the reward of maintaining the ties of kinship. So if a person is not having anything, that how can he help out others? So a person is supposed to accumulate the wealth through lawful channels. Then, then and only then he'll be able to help out others. And this helping others, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wallahu fi awni al-abdi ma kan al-abdu fi awni akhi. Allah helps his servant as long as his servant helps his brother or sister. And when a person spends in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is blessed and he gets the barakah and the blessings of the supplications of the angels. Prophet every morning with the sunrise, two angels, they make dua. One angel, it, it makes dua. Allahumma a'ati munfiqan salafa. Oh Allah, you compensate the one who spent in your path. You grant him more and more barakah. Allahumma a'ati munfiqan salafa. O Allah, the one who spent the wealth in your path. You give him abundantly. You compensate him of your own. And then another angel, he makes another dua. It's a bad supplication, bad dua. Allahumma a'ati munfiqan talafa. O Allah, you destroy the wealth of a person who did not spend in your path. So when a person spends the path of Allah, he gets the supplications, the barakah of the supplications of the angels, which a person who is deprived of the wealth cannot have. So these are the advantages of the wealth. When a person is having the wealth, he can achieve the higher stations of the Jannah. He can perform a lot of ibadah. He can help out, he can help many a people to be released of the distrust, to be released of the anguish, to be released of the of the uh, untoward situations. He can help them to be re relieved of the hardships of life. And this way, he can get the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, worldly life, according to the Quran and Sunnah, is not altogether to be dispraised at all. Rather, there are many advantages of it. And, when a person gives zakah, his, his, actually his, his contributing towards the upliftment of the depressed class of the society. Zakah is our social responsibility. Being a responsible citizens of the Islamic society, we, have, we owe certain responsibilities towards other fellow beings. If they are facing the hardships and Allah has given us the wealth, and we are instrument, we are a means to remove their hardships. What else we need in our life? Once we can, we are able to just provide the food to, to, to the hungry stomach, the moment he takes one single morsel, at that point of time, the dua he makes for the person who was able to provide the food to him is, Wallahi, I don't think that there is any barrier between the one who makes his dua and the Arsh of Rahman. Once a hungry stomach is being fed, once the person is helped, so how come a person will earn all these rewards when he doesn't have the wealth? So wealth is important, but not our objective in life. It's our need in life, not purpose in life. So we need to just, just mark a line of demarcation between the two. Wealth is our need in life, not purpose in life. 
And as far as the wealth is concerned, as I said before, that it has many worldly advantages and it is also disadvantages. We need to know what are the advantages of the wealth, what are the disadvantages of the wealth. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a tawfiq, to develop a positive approach towards the worldly life and the worldly possessions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to let this worldly life distract us from Him. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhanallah wa hamdihi, subhanak Allah wa hamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiru ka wa'atu ilayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzat amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.